the um, ongoing series that we have in Colossians on In the Word. Uh, I do this about every two weeks, um, part of a um, Bible study here in Estes Park, if you're interested in attending. Uh, when you're in the Estes Park area, certainly send me a note at uh, Dr. Dan, D-R-D-A-N, at theofaith.org, and I'll uh, include you in our um, uh, email list so you know where we're meeting and how to get a hold of me. Uh, we'll take a look today. Uh, we're continuing in Colossians. We are going a paragraph at a time. We're in Colossians 1, 21 through 23 today. Just a couple of uh, paragraph but uh, verses, but uh, jam-packed full of, uh, of uh, significant knowledge, theology that our Lord wants us to know about. Here's our overview of where we're um, going through Colossians. We are in this section here, uh, closing up the creation account, uh, talking about uh, Jesus and his supremacy in the church. Um, in fact, just by way of um, review, we can say that in verses 1 through 8, we looked at uh, the signs of a healthy church where Jesus is supreme. And we saw that in verse 4, for example, there was uh, faith for all the brethren, love for all the sa faith in Christ, uh, love for all the saints, and uh, motivated by hope. Uh, our object of hope, of course, is Jesus. Verses 9 through 14, we looked at the uh, prayer that Paul had for the spiritual growth of the church and um, how that was um, important uh, to that church. And again, a sign of the supremacy of Christ in his church. And certainly uh, any church where Christ is supreme, that is, that is where his uh, word is taught uh, in an expository way. Yeah, the commands concerning his church are obeyed and put into place. Uh, certainly there will be health and growth there. In verses 15 to 20, we see also that uh, there's uh, where Christ is supreme. He's, of course, exalted. Exalted over creation, the head of creation, and the head of this church. What we'll see today in uh, verses 21 through 23 is um, that people are transformed where Christ reigns supreme. And we'll see this uh, change that takes place in verses 21 through 22, and then a challenge in verse 23. In fact, if you've got, uh, I pray that you have your Bible in front of you as we go through this. Uh, if you don't, I ask you to uh, just take a moment pause the video and uh, grab your Bible so you can follow along as we move through this. Trust you have your Bibles now and uh, let me read these verses for us. Starting in chapter 1 of Colossians verse 21, And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and a prov reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has pro been proclaimed to all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. That's God's word for us today. Raise us some questions. I want to raise some questions in our mind. Uh, you know, Paul repeats uh, reconcile a couple times here. He's mentioned it in verse 20, mentions it again in verse 22. So when we see repeated words like this, we should drill in and say, you know, what does this mean? What does he mean by reconcile? Notice also that in verse 21, this alienation, hostility in, is in the mind. So why a focus on the mind? For those of you who uh, kind of follow along with me or have been raised in churches where we talk about the uh, perseverance of the saints or the uh, eternal salvation that is given to us as a gift, or sometimes we even use the term once saved, always saved, uh, 
uh, this question in uh, our condition in verse 23 uh, may raise some questions in your mind, such as, have I lost my salvation if I sin? Is that what, is that what that's talking about? And finally, Paul says that uh, the gospel has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven. So how, how could the gospel have been preached to every person on earth in Paul's day? So maybe it raises some questions as we go into the uh, passage that we could clear up. When we look at verses 21 through 22, we see a change that's happening. We'll get into the details here, but I wanted to set the stage by just pointing out that uh, in the Bible, uh, there's some changes that are positional and happen immediately, just at the moment of salvation, and some changes that happen in our experience and are more gradual over time. So those immediate changes are objective, whether we have some experience or not, they're true of us. At the moment of salvation, for example, uh, we are baptized into Christ's body. We are identified with him. Uh, we see the condemned are justified at the moment of salvation. Uh, your righteousness is declared. Uh, those who are away and alienated and far off from God are brought near. Those who are at war with God experience peace. Those things happen immediately. Some changes, though, we experience over time, and these are subjective things that we notice in ourselves, behavioral things primarily. Sometimes they're also attitudinal. Um, so when we are, we'll see when Paul talks about being hostile and reconciled, we move from evil deeds to good works. So these are the range of change that we see in the Bible. And as we go through these verses, we'll reflect on that kind of change or what kind of change we're experiencing. Let's talk a moment about the transition. Paul's moving from verses 15 through 20, where Christ is highly exalted over creation and over his church, uh, to verses 21 through 23. What Paul does here, uh, he's moving from exposition to the application of God's word. He's moving from doctrine to life. Not that there's a difference between them, uh, we live out doctrine, and Paul is showing us how to do that, or how that doctrine is lived out in our lives. We also see that uh, from kind of the universal to the specific. So in the previous verses, we see Jesus reconciled everything on earth, everything in heaven to himself. Here we move to this particular significance for the Colossians. It's you know, I understand, Paul, God has done this on a cosmic basis. He's done this on a global basis. What does that mean to me now, right where I'm at? We ask those same questions as we read the Bible, as we understand doctrine. That's one of the uh, tragedies of doctrine is that so often it's presented in abstractions, presented in a theoretical framework, and never brought to bear on life. And the Bible doesn't let us do that, and that's what we see here. It's what this global cosmic doctrine has impact in time and space. And it's in Jesus himself. He's going to emphasize his body, his death. It's Jesus himself where time, where eternity and time meet together. It's in Jesus himself when what happens cosmically and globally comes to bear not only on Colossae, but on you and I, right where we're at. So Jesus' supremacy is not just an abstraction, uh, it's a reality and should be in our lives. So let's walk through this. Uh, Paul begins with how we once were. You who were once. Let's point out here what's obvious is that um, Paul is speaking to a very specific group of people, the church at Colossae. Uh, as far as we can tell from the book of Colossians, and I pray that you've read through it, uh, this is a good church. Uh, Paul has commended them for their faith, their love, driven by hope. Uh, they've had 
hard workers are emerging from that church. There's evidence of love in the spirit among them. We saw that in verses 1 through 8. So this is a specific group of people. This is not everyone, but you who were once a certain way. And let's just walk through this. They were once alienated. And the verb there lets us know uh, that this is a continuing condition. It's a continuing condition that's in their past, that they had been constantly, continuously estranged. We can say even a foreigner that was cut off from God. And as we go through the rest of the Bible, the New Testament, we find out that they were alienated from Christ. Uh, We see that in verse 20, where he talks about uh, they've been brought near uh, through Christ. Looking for that verse here. Uh, uh, Making peace, reconciled to himself all things. So they were reconciled to Christ. They were alienated from him. Ephesians 2.12, a companion epistle with uh, Paul's uh, other prison epistles, Philippians and Colossians. They kind of mutually inform each other. Paul says that, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ. Then he goes on, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. And remember, uh, doesn't seem maybe significant to us today, But remember, Jesus told the woman at the well that salvation comes by the Jews. So being cut off from the commonwealth of Israel means they were cut off from salvation. And strangers to the covenant having no hope. So at one point they were cut off from Christ, cut off from Israel and the salvation that was offered to them. Ephesians 4.18 also tells us they were cut off from the life of God, that is the life that belongs to God, the eternal life. That was their, uh, at one time they were alienated. He goes on to say, and uh, let me just address this first. Um, Is this positional or experiential? Is this a uh, situation they were in or something that that was behavioral, behavioral, (laughs) behavioral or um, part of their attitude? Clearly, it's, it's their mind. Uh, I think that's a uh, figure of speech for their thinking. Their mind was what was alienated, not some three and a half pound um, um, mass of tissue, but uh, their thinking. Their thinking was cut off from God. Uh, their thinking was cut off from the source of truth. So we can say that they had this stinking thinking, we can call it. And we see that uh, throughout the Bible. Let me just give you one example. In Romans 1, 21 through 23, it says, For although they knew God, this is all of mankind. Paul's making the, in the context, if you go look at this verse, Paul's saying that there's sufficient revelation in nature, in the creation itself, to let people know that God exists. So he says, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God, or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. How silly to uh, worship the created thing rather than the creation or creator is what Paul is saying here. That's just a sign of their foolishness. And a foolishness that uh, becomes, uh, is on all men. Again, in the context of Romans 1, 18 to 320, Paul is building the case that all men have become fools. All men are futile in their thinking. So the Colossians at one point were among all these men whose... uh, Uh, were alienated in their mind. It's not just a neutral alienation, not just a passive ignorance, but really an active opposition to God. There is no middle ground where people are just indifferent to God. We see that in the next uh, phrase. They will hostile, ekthros. It's uh, a noun on some Uh, translations, 
but in the Greek text and uh, some newer translations, it's uh, translated as an adjective. So some your Bible may say they were enemies, uh, but uh, my Bible says uh, they were hostile, hostile to God. It means they were hating him, obviously hostile to him. Or we can use the biblical word from uh, Genesis 3, at enmity with God, opposing him. And again, constantly, continually, actively hostile. This is aimed uh, at Christ, uh, but at the Father as well. Uh, they find themselves, it says in Philippians, another one of the compa- uh, prison epistles, that they were enemies of the cross of Christ. Again, this is, uh, shows us that um, it's not just that people are indifferent to God or ignorant of him. They are hostile toward him. We'll discuss in a moment why. Uh, but we see that all who are uh, hostile in mind, hostile in their thinking to the truth, they're, they're not just indifferent to it. Um, we see that not only do they have stinking thinking, but that sin makes them stupid. <laughs> we were all in this one at one point. Sin makes us stupid. In fact, we can see it. How can anyone have hostility toward God? How could that even be possible to have hostility toward God? Nevertheless, the Bible says that um, people are hostile toward him. That's what it says here, hostile in mind. We see that uh, in the Bible uh, that those who are hostile enemies of God are going to suffer his wrath. Again, back to Romans, Romans 1, 18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Uh, I often think of a, uh, of a person in a swimming pool trying to hold a beach ball under the water. Uh, that's the uh, suppression of the truth. Unrighteousness requires, um, um, is the pressure that holds that truth down. Of course, it's ultimately going to emerge from the water uh, fly into the sky with a big, a big uh, splash, but that's the uh, just an illustration of the silliness of trying to do that, the stupidity of trying to hold back the truth. It's always going to triumph. It's always going to emerge. We see in Hebrews ten thirty one also uh, just this: it is fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Uh, I think that speaks for itself, but uh, the idea here, of course, is that uh, those who are against God, his enemy, uh, have at enmity with him, that are alienated and hostile toward him, uh, are going to fall into his hands for judgment. And even in the book of Revelation, it's very interesting how far this rebellion, uh, this anger against God goes. We have a group of people in the book of Revelation called the earth dwellers. Those are people who are um, left on earth, who are still on earth and still opposing God, uh, who have not yet come to faith even under the uh, wrath of God. And they're calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Isn't that interesting? They know where the judgment is coming from. Nevertheless, they continue to shake their fist at God. Hide us from him. Hide us from the face of him who is on the throne. No hint of repentance here, but rather just fleeing from him. And we know that if they continue to do that uh, at the end of the book of Revelation, uh, they will be raised from the dead and cast into the eternal lake of fire uh, where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth forever. So they go on here, still looking at their former state, you who were once, uh, not only were their minds affected by alienation, 
and hostility, but this erupted in their actions. Uh, doing evil deeds. Evil there is poneros. Um, in the context here, morally or socially worthless, base, vicious, degenerate actions. Don't we see that in the world today? Don't we see among unsafe people um, this uh, degeneration uh, that's happening in our culture? Again, I won't take us back to Romans again, but if you read 118 through 320, uh, you'll see a, uh, a downward spiral of what happens to a culture that re rejects God. So what this is telling us here in this verse, uh, verse 21, is that their thinking, alienation and hostility in mind, uh, is translated to their doing. And we see that uh, throughout the Bible, again, this is consistent with the testimony of the rest of the Bible, that uh, the fruit of an evil mind ultimately can't be hidden. It's going to come out. I'll show you some verses on that in a minute. But before we go on to that, again, ask our question, is this positional or is it experiential? And obviously, clearly, experiential as well. Their actions are evil. Um, they um, doing evil things because they have hostility toward God. We see this, again, clearly, uh, in the rest of the New Testament, Jesus tells us that we're going to recognize false teachers by their fruit. Uh, in Matthew 7, 20, uh, warns us that uh, the world is going, hates Jesus because he testifies that the works of the world are evil. Uh, even um, pious religious works like the Pharisees were doing, uh, they were trying to... Uh, uh, obey the Mosaic law by putting protective laws around it. And they kind of missed the point of the whole law. And those are evil works. And Jesus is saying, you know, the Pharisees obviously hated Jesus, the elders of Israel, uh, the priests of Israel, and then that flowed over into the Roman Empire as well. The Roman governor hated Jesus. And why? Because he showed them that their works were evil. Titus 1.16, they profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for every good work. So again, they may say one thing, but their works ultimately show them for what they really are. And uh, that's the point here, back to Rome, back to 1 Colossians, or Colossians 1.21, is that... Uh, the hostility and the alienation of their minds inevitably and ultimately erupts in evil deeds. So their thinking and their doing are opposed to God and they are at, at root um, angry with God. Why is that? Why are people angry with him? Well, one of the things I learned, my wife and I learned in raising six children uh, together was that wherever you draw the line, there's the fight. If you're a parent or going to be a parent, remember that. Wherever you draw the line, whether you are a strict parent or a lenient parent, all parents draw lines somewhere and uh, your children uh, will rebel no matter where you draw the line. We see the same principle it working in humanity, wherever God draws the line, there's a fight and anger and hostility. Where does he draw the line? Jesus made it clear in Matthew 22. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So total, complete love for God, total, complete love for your neighbor. And I define love uh, operationally or biblically as um, commitment, totally committed to God, committed to your neighbor. That's what God demands from us, that overflowing love toward him and toward our neighbor. Who could do that? But that's the line that God has drawn, an impossible line. And so often, uh, where we have impossible demands that are put on us, um, we rebel, we get angry, 
we get frustrated, we get mad. And that's what we see is that uh, the world is hostile to God because God's demands are ultimately unattainable apart from Christ. So let's stop here for a moment and just reflect. Uh, don't want to go on. We want to ask the so what question. Well, we can learn from this first verse here that uh, it's good to take some time to reflect on once on what we once were. Um, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I lived for a relatively long time apart from Christ uh, till I was nearly 30 and uh, enjoyed or indulged, and maybe is a better word, uh, the sins of the world. Uh, so it's, um, when I look back uh, on my own soul, my own life, I can see clearly uh, my alienation and hostility toward God and the evil deeds I did. Some of you grew up in a Christian home, maybe a little bit more difficult. You may have come to faith uh, at a very young age and, you know, God bless you for that and God bless him for his grace in your life. But it's important that we look at ourselves um, from God's perspective, not comparing ourselves with ourselves or with someone else, but comparing ourselves with what God's word says about us. And it says clearly here, we were alienated, hostile, and evil. So whether you lived decades apart from the Lord and had a catalog of evil deeds, or you were just apart from the Lord for a short period of time and raised faithfully in the uh, faith uh, either way, uh, you and I are on the same play, playing field, the same level ground at the cross. That God looks at us and he sees us as people who were alienated, hostile, and evil. Look at these verses from Genesis 6. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Sounds a lot like Colossians 1, 21, doesn't it? Jer speaking through the prophet Jeremiah, God warns us the heart is deceitful among all things, desperately sick. Who can understand it? You know, it's, it's an arresting verse. I mean, not only are deceitful, sick, and beyond even our understanding. And of course, Romans 3.23, kind of a famous verse, all have sinned, that's you and I, uh, whether we were Christians for a short time or a long time, all have sinned and far short of the glory of God. So it's good, I think, for us to reflect on what we once were, but not to stay there. Paul doesn't either. He goes on in verse 22, and you who, were, who once were, he has now. What wonderful words he has now. This is Paul's main point here. He's repeating reconciliation again from verse 20. It says there that Jesus had reconciled the whole universe, reconciled hostile spiritual and earthly powers. The faith in Christ that the Colossians have, Paul told us that in verse 4, um, leads to their salvation and reconciles, renews, and purifies the Colossians. Let me make it clear here that this is uh, just faith alone and nothing else. Like this quote from uh, Lewis Berry Chafer, upwards of 115 New Testament passages condition salvation on believing. And Fully 35 passages condition salvation on faith. And faith, in, in this use of it, is an exact synonym for belief. These portions of Scripture, totaling about 150 in all, including practically all the New Testament, are include practically all that the New Testament declares on the matter of human responsibility in salvation. It's faith alone. The Colossians demonstrate this faith. They have this faith. Paul recognizes it in verse 4 of chapter 1. 
so he can say that they're reconciled. So what does that mean? Reconciled means to restore friendship or harmony or to make peace. And note here, uh, he has now reconciled uh, in he has now reconciled uh, in his body of flesh by his death. So uh, you is the object there. You, the Colossians, and by extension, you and I are the ones that were reconciled to God. Believing Colossians were reconciled to him. And it's the blood that Jesus shed on the cross in his body of flesh by his death, as the point Paul makes here, uh, that pays for the sin of Adam and through Adam, uh, the sin of all people. You know, Romans 5.15 makes this clear. I'm going to turn to that verse right now just to draw your attention to it. Um, there is a sense in which Christ pays for our personal sins. That's certainly true. But uh, the theological thing uh, here is that it's um, the sin of Adam that's been passed down to us that Christ dies for and through his death cleanses us from. Verse 15 of chapter or verse 15 of Romans chapter 5 says that the free gift is not like the trespass for if many died through one's man's trespass that's many died through Adam much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man Jesus Christ abounded for many. So by one man's sin all sinned by one man's act of obedience, all men may be saved. What Jesus does, and we talked about this last time, is he removes that enmity uh, from Genesis 3.15. Again, I'm turning there just to uh, bring our attention to it right at the beginning of the Bible. Uh, part of the curse after the fall the curse that fell on all men through Adam and Eve says that um, I will put enmity between you and the woman. Did you catch that enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring? He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. What Jesus has in, or God has in mind here, that offspring of the woman is the ultimate offspring that's going to bring salvation, uh, the Messiah in the Old Testament, whom we know as Jesus in the New Testament. He's going to put enmity between the offspring um, um, of the woman and uh, the offspring of Satan and the offspring of the woman, that enmity, that anger, that hostility. Uh, that we talked about, that alienation. Jesus, is, Jesus removes that. That's what it means to be reconciled, that enmity is taken away and replaced by friendship. I like um, S. Lewis Johnson, uh, when he preached on these verses, uh, entitled it from enmity to amity, that is from hostility to friendship also point out uh, that uh, reconciliation is one of the uh, three great doctrines of salvation. Be good to be familiar with these and reflect on them. Uh, redemption, propitiation, and reconciliation are three great uh, doctrines. We can uh, think of them as uh, redemption being uh, sinward. That is, God has paid in Christ a ransom price for the human sin, uh, as I say here, without, uh, with that outraged his holiness, that his outraged holiness and government requires. So Jesus pays this um, price that God's offense demand, that the offense made to God demands. Propitiation, on the other hand, is God word. Again, it's God who's at work. He provides his own sacrifice that satisfies his wrath, his demand for justice. And it propitiates him, makes, us, makes him propitious toward us. 
That is, he is, has now good will or favor toward us. So we are bought out of the kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of light, uh, as it says in um, verse 14 of Colossians chapter 1, 13 and 14. Uh, he, uh, we move from being uh, um, at odds with God to having his goodwill or favor. And finally, reconciliation, what we're considering here is manward. That again, again, it's God that provides the sacrifice. And it completely changes the relationship between God and man. As I said, from enmity, from being at odds, uh, to being friendly. Uh, in fact, more than friendly. God loves us. And that's what this hap- what happens here is um, this uh, complete change in relationship. To go on in verse 22 then, uh, we find that this is, happens in his body of flesh by his death. His body of flesh is the means of making reconciliation. Jesus had to physically die in the place of sinful man. You know, Islam would say that Jesus just appeared to die on the cross. He didn't actually die. And of course, in Islam, Jesus' death has no salvation, salvation purpose. So they've separated that and they've said that uh, Jesus didn't really die physically. He just appeared to die. But the Bible makes it clear here He uh, died in his body of flesh. So he pays for everyone's sin. Uh, Romans 5.18 again, back to Romans. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness, that is what Paul's talking about here in verse 22, uh, his body of flesh in his death leads to justification and life for all men. So Jesus um, was incarnated. The reason he was born was to die, was to provide a body to sacrifice in the behalf of men. So well, from the very beginning, Jesus' incarnation was purposeful. We see that in Hebrews 10. It's impossible for the blood of gold, bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, or therefore, or as a result, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. Look what he's saying there. Um, This is a body that God has specially prepared for Christ. This is speaking to the virgin birth, not a body that's been prepared by man and woman but a body that is uniquely and specifically fashioned to be a body to sacrifice in order to do what the blood of bulls and goats could not do. And again, as I've said before, if you uh, follow along in our uh, daily in the words where we're going through the book of, or the New Testament from Romans to Revelation, a chapter at a time, Uh, This week I talked on Wednesday, I talked about Romans 3 and uh, Romans uh, 3, 21 through 31, which talks about God's sacrifice of Jesus is really the center point of history. And I think the center point of the Bible, Uh, it talks about that the means that were necessary uh, that God had to provide in order to make this tremendous change from being hostile to God to being holy. The whole Bible points, uh, the whole Old Testament, everything up to chapter 3, verse 21 in Romans, points forward to that, anticipates it. Everything after that in the Bible history points back to it as explaining it. It's really the center point of the Bible, center point of history. Jesus is then, uh, his reconciliation is preparing for a future day. He talks, Paul talks here in verse 22 about in order to present you holy, blameless, and above reproach before him. So he's talking about uh, how this prepares the believer, you and I, when we will be presented before the Lord. You know, there's a day uh, 
when we will stand before the Lord and we're going to receive uh, what Paul was talking about back in verse 5 of chapter 1 of Colossians, the fullness of the hope. We have a foretaste of it now, but we don't have the fullness. Jesus is that fullness of the hope. And what the rest of the Bible tells us is that this is referring to the day when you and I are going to receive our reward for what we've done here on earth. Colossians 3 talks about it. He says, each one's work will become manifest for the day. This is that day of a a judgment, a day of assessment of believers will disclose it. It will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. So there's this future day when our works will be tested and uh, we'll receive, 2 Corinthians 5 says, what we are due. It says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Again, this is not talking about eternal judgment. That has been dealt with at the cross that our eternal destiny is determined and secured by God. This is talking about the kind of work that we've done in the body and what kind of reward that we'll get for it. Go read those verses in um, context and you'll see that clearly. This is talking about preparing us uh, for that final assessment and rewards goes on here, holy, hagios is the word here, a positional change. We were, were set apart from sin and set apart to God. So at the moment that we are, uh, we put our faith in Christ, uh, the Colossians and us as well are credited with Jesus's righteousness. That's what Philippians 3, 8 and 9 tells us that at that moment of salvation, a Christ's righteousness becomes ours. Let me read that for you. Philippians 3, verse 8, starting in verse 8. Indeed, I count everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. So that is the righteousness that is given to us. Jesus' righteousness credited to us. Make a change from being alienated, hostile, and doing evil deeds to being holy, set apart for God. A change, another positional change of being Above reproach, Uh, this is blameless, beyond criticism. This is a courtroom term that we have no charge that can be brought against us. Another positional change change here from being open to accusation to being even beyond criticism. So again, at the moment of salvation, uh, all of our evil thoughts and our evil deeds and the consequences that we deserve are uh, eradicated and we are moved from being open to all kinds of accusation and criticism to not being subject to any of it anymore. And Paul is going to talk more about this as we go through Colossians. He's going to warn them, uh, you know, don't let people pass judgment on you. Don't let anyone disqualify you. And Uh, Brothers and sisters, there's people who would try to uh, work their way into the church to lead us astray by putting uh, accusations against us and telling us that we are uh, somehow inferior. Um, Certainly there's a need to continue to grow in maturity, but I think the message here is that in Christ, we have been put into a different position altogether. Um, We are no longer subject to any accusation, um, but uh, instead we are just growing in the Lord at this point. So let's summarize this um, before we move on to the challenge. Uh, We see the Colossians were at one time hostile to God. Uh, 
actively and intentionally doing shameful things. And God's used Jesus' physical death uh, as a means to satisfy his demand for justice for the sins of the Colossians. That's what Paul's telling them. And he's telling us as well that we were one time hostile to God. But God offered Jesus and his physical death as his tool to satisfy his demand for judgment. So that as the Colossians, when they had faith, so us, when we exercise faith and when we did exercise faith, we were set apart from sin and set apart to God. Jesus's righteousness was credited to our account and we were put beyond criticism. I pray that as you reflect on this, uh, it, uh, you could feel the burden lifting, lifted from you. This is a great thing to uh, reflect on. Because now we can stand before God with the Colossians without fear of any condemnation. Go back again to Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Uh, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So let's pause here again for a so what moment. Uh, So what about this? Uh, It's not only good to reflect on what we were, but what Christ has done. And again, just as we looked at what we were from God's perspective, let's look at what we are from God's perspective. Let's not compare ourselves to ourselves. Uh, particularly. I think so often uh, as Christians, it's easy for us to beat ourselves up because we of all people see how far we fall short, uh, how far that we have been um, uh, fall short of God's full glory. And we long for it. You know, we, we cry out for it, but not a reason to beat ourselves up, but a reason to Rejoice, a reason to be glad and thankful to Christ. As 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that uh, we are a new creation in him. We can see that new creation by just comparing verses 21 to verse 22. All that God has done for us. So don't beat yourselves up because of how far you fall short. That's Satan at work. Rather, rejoice as you see how far you've come and even how far you have to go. Rejoice that God is at work. And Christ has not only made you a new creation, but he is making you a new creation, as we'll see in these next verses. So that summarizes the change. Let's go to the challenge. They go together. We're called to be all that we can be, and uh, that's what we see here. So, verse 23, let me just read that for you. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. Huh. First question we could ask ourselves and might make us nervous uh, if we've grown up in churches that teach the doctrine of eternal salvation. Is this a condition? Is Paul now giving us a condition for salvation? I don't think that's the case. Uh, I'll tell you why here. First of all, as we saw earlier, uh, more than 150 times in the New Testament, we see salvation based on faith, period. No condition, nothing else. We see, if we look through the Bible, lots of passages, I just listed three of them here, uh, that guarantee eternal life for everyone who believes that this is a guaranteed thing. Um, You know, if um, some people have often said that if we could lose our salvation, we would, but it's God that keeps our salvation secure. Let's look at Romans for, or John 5, 24, for example says, truly, truly, this is Jesus. So he's saying, hey, listen up, listen closely here. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. 
He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. He's saying that they have eternal life because they have believed. There's lots of passages that say that those who have eternal life, that those who have passed from death to life, uh, are not going to um, uh, be lost. Uh, again, in the Gospel of John, if you're still there, John 6.39 says, And this is the will, this is Jesus speaking, And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone looks on the Son and believes in him, should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So Jesus is clearly saying here that all those who have eternal life, all those who believe on the Son, believes in him, shall be raised up on the last day. And that's, that's God's will. That is what God intends. And let me also point out uh, that the uh, past action, if this, is, if this verse 23, if the if you continue is pointing back to being reconciled, as this would say, if it's making it a condition of salvation, um, that past act, they are already reconciled. That's not a, uh, that's not a, um, that's a past tense there, an aorist verb. Uh, the action of being reconciled in the past is not conditioned on the present action of continuing. In other words, it says clearly they have been reconciled. So I think for these reasons, it's really unlikely that we're adding a condition here for being reconciled to God. Some would say that this is a condition or proof text for true salvation. We could also look at this and say that this is the proof that saints persevere. In other words, is Paul saying that those who continue are the truly saved and the others are not? So like the last option, uh, where this is a condition for salvation, uh, this connects um, the condition here, if indeed you continue, back to reconciliation. And as I said before, I think this is true here as well, as significant here, that in 22a, Paul says the Colossians are now reconciled. It doesn't say they could be reconciled or they might be reconciled. He says they are reconciled. And as if you go through the epistle, I just listed a few verses here, but if you go through the whole epistle and make a list of the things that Paul says about this church, you'll see they are a believing church. Um, they are uh, a church that have paced their faith in Christ. So for Paul at this point to say that this good church um, has been uh, uh, reconciled maybe, or reconciled could be, or reconciled if they, it just, it just is inconsistent with everything that Paul has said about this church. It would likely be confusing to them. Also, I'd point out that Paul says that uh, if indeed you continue in the faith. Well, this, of course, presupposes an ongoing faith that began according to verse 4 of faith they placed in Christ at salvation. So Paul is not telling them that they, uh, um, their faith is in doubt, but rather that their faith should continue um, and continue stable and steadfast. So I think it's unlikely that Paul's talking again here about a condition or a proof of their true salvation. Their salvation is... Uh, is uh, beyond a doubt, I think, at this point. Their salvation is beyond uh, question. Could be that this is a condition for holiness. Uh, we can see that, uh, take Jesus himself. Uh, in Matthew, if we just look at the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus gives all, well over 300 different commands to his followers in the Gospel of Matthew. Over a thousand in the whole Old Testament if you 
count the synoptics. We look at the epistles that follow the Gospels. They contain challenge after challenge to live a life set apart to God, which is what we see here. Throughout the book of Colossians, if we bring this down to the uh, specifics of this book and the other uh, um, prison epistles, we see challenge after challenge, command after command for the believers. Of course, Romans 2, 12, 1 and 2 is a famous, uh, famous challenge uh, uh, for uh, believers uh, to continue or grow in the Lord. Um, turn into Romans 12, 1 and 2 right now. It says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but to the transformation by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may deserve, discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So this could be a challenge to pursue the practical holiness that their reconciliation demands. We know from the form of the question here, it's a first class condition. If you are familiar with Greek, Paul is confident they're going to do this, confident they're going to persevere. But it does point out the fact that holiness is normal in the Christian life, but not inevitable. So it could be uh, that this is a challenge to pursue practical holiness that their reconciliation demands. So again, these last three options tie the uh, challenge to reconciliation but I think there's a better option here. I think this is a condition for future reward. And there's several reasons why I bring this up. So first is that the immediate con in this immediate context, if you just look at where the verse is, the immediate context is the nearest antecedent, that is the thing that it's referring to, if indeed, is not reconciliation, but that presentation in order to present you, in order to present you. So it's not referring, in my view, to reconciliation, but to the presentation before God that we said before is going to come to every believer. When he talks about in the faith then in verse 23, it's the same faith in verse 4 that led to reconciliation, uh, that same faith that's rooted in hope. So what Paul is saying here is they are continue, continue in the Christian life just as they started it by faith. He'll say this again just a little later in Colossians. He says, therefore, as you received Christ, and how did they receive Christ Jesus the Lord? By faith. So walk in him by faith. So in my view, the immediate context indicates that this is not a condition associated with reconciliation with their salvation, but a condition associated for their future presentation when they were presented before the Lord. I think the context of the larger book of Colossians also supports this. So their faith and their reconciliation and their transformation, none of these things are in doubt. Paul is commending them on their faith. They're saying they've been reconciled. He's saying that they've been transformed. These are not things that are in doubt in any way and shouldn't, I think, be a condition on them. It's just inconsistent with the rest of the Bible. But the idea that he's preparing them for a presentation in the future is consistent with the rest of what Paul is saying. In verse 28, he's concerned is to present everyone mature in Christ. He's got this presentation in his mind. And it's consistent with his desire that they continue to walk in the same faith that led them to salvation. And I mentioned this verse earlier. 
So again, the immediate context of the verse seems to point to the presentation, not reconciliation. The larger concern of Colossians is about their presentation. And again, in the context of the whole New Testament, we see that the believer's presentation before God is discussed regularly in the Bible. And the future rewards that are associated with that presentation is the motivation for faithfulness and holiness, which is exactly what Paul's talking about in Colossians here. And we know from one of the other prison epistles that Christ's intent is to sanctify the church and present her as holy. So again, the idea here is this moment of presentation, this time of presentation, when her works are going to be assessed and she'll be rewarded according to her works. Um, even even uh, future rewards and blamelessness and being above reproach are somewhat, are not somewhat, but are conditional on what is... Uh, happened in our life and what's going to happen at that um, uh, presentation before him. Listen to 1 John 2, 28. It says, Now little children, abide in him. This is how John says, continue in the faith. Abide in him for this reason, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. Shrink from him in shame. That is coming. Again, our future reward and our being uh, blameless is associated with our readiness at that time of presentation before him. So for these reasons, I think that uh, the if you continue should be connected not to reconciliation, but to the presentation. And this is, I think, the best view uh, that Paul's conditioning this future reward on continu continuing faithfulness. Not that we'll miss our salvation, but we'll miss our reward. I think it best fits the immediate context, the context of the book, and what the other New Testament passages say about the presentation before the Lord. So, this is a great place to just stop for a moment and ask, so what? Well, the so what is for you and I, brothers and sisters, that how we live now has eternal impact, eternal consequence. Look what Paul says in Romans 12, 6. He's talking about the giving of gifts and how our gifts, and he says, having gifts that differ according to the grace given us, let us use them. So he's first acknowledging that we have gifts. Everyone has different gifts. Then he encourages them. Let us use them. We see this in Ephesians 2.10. Stated another way and builds on it. It says we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. So our good works are a fruit and not the root of our salvation. What happens as a result? Uh, it's not something we earn. It's not the way we earn our salvation, but it's the fruit of it, the result of it. So we've been created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared for beforehand. So these good works, we've been equipped in Romans 12. They are uh, our purpose in life. God's got them ready for us to do. The last clause there, we need to get on with it. We need to walk in them. We need to do them. So, brothers and sisters, whatever your spiritual gift might be, identify it. And if you don't know how to do that, contact me and I'll help you. Uh, and then put that gift to work in your church. Go to your pastor. Go to the elders. Tell them I've taken this spiritual gift assessment uh, I believe this is my spiritual gift. I want to be at work uh, using my gifts, as Ephesians 2.10 says I should. I want to be laying up treasure in heaven. That's what we need to do today. That's the so what. That what we do now has eternal consequence for us.
Let's go on here and finish up verse 23 then as we work our way through the book of Colossians. Um, lost my spot here, so let me get back to it. It says in verse 23, he goes on to say, not shifting from the hope of the gospel. So hope is the uh, motivating factor for their lives in verse 5. And Paul's saying, hey, don't lose sight of that motivation that's rooted in hope. Other to be stable, steadfast, not shifting. It sounds like he's building a house here on the hope, right? He's uh, building a, uh, uh, this is the foundation of their Christian life, the uh, engine uh, Romans 12, 6 and Ephesians 2, 10 give us direction or vector. Hope gives us thrust. If you're lacking motivation, uh, place your hope more surely in Christ. And that'll be your secure foundation. Again, in a companion uh, prison epistle, Paul's got this in his mind about the foundation of the church. He says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens. Sounds like verse 21. But you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. They've made that transition that verse 22 talks about. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. That's where we're at, brothers and sisters. We are not, again, have a condition associated with our salvation. We are being built together. We are growing into a holy temple in the Lord. That's what's happening to us now. And that's what Paul's urging the Ephesians to do. And he's doing the same thing here in verses 21 through 23. And as we mentioned, I just brought this slide forward when, from the first session we had. Uh, Jesus is the object of our hope. We put our hope in him. We put our um, hope in Christ without whom we would have no hope. So we are looking forward to the return of Jesus. Let's go on here. It says that this hope has been proclaimed in all creation. Well, clearly the gospel had not yet been preached to every person on earth. So what does this verse mean? In fact, we can even say today that there are over 7,000 people groups in the world who are unreached by the gospel. Isn't that something? So there's a, um, you can find the website for the Joshua Project, which keeps track of all the people groups in the world. And a people group is uh, defined by a common language, uh, both spoken and written, among other things, a common culture. There's 17,000 people groups in the world. Over 7,000 have um, are un what they're considered to be unreached and unevangelized people groups. That is, they have no gospel, have no portion of the Bible in their own language, uh, no missionary working among them. So we can even say today that the uh, gospel has been proclaimed um, in all the earth. Um, looking for the first here, I've lost my place. Um, hasn't been proclaimed in all creation. If Paul is talking about um, every single person. So I think in the context here, and in the time that Paul's living, I don't think he's saying that the gospel's been proclaimed to every different person on earth as much as it's been proclaimed to both Jew and Gentile on the earth. Recall that Paul's normal um, method was to first go to the synagogue until the synagogue didn't want him anymore. They'd kick him out, toss him out on the street, and then he would gather to himself um, people who are willing to listen and um, which included Jews and Gentiles. So what he's talking about here when he says all creation, he's not talking about all without exception, but all without distinction. That is Jew and Gentile. 
And the Colossians know that because they are among the Gentiles. So we may have kind of a swipe here, and we're going to get to chapter 2. We'll talk about the opposition that may be arising in the church, but could be a swipe at the false teachers that are in Colossae because their teaching was local and it seemed like it was aimed at the Jews. Paul is saying that this gospel that he's preaching, this gospel about the supremacy of Christ, what Christ has done not only cosmically but universally, but also among the Colossians, this is uh, for everyone, everyone without distinction. Also say for those who would say that all creation means without exception, um, you know, we're not universalists. We don't think that everyone is going to be going to heaven, that there are definitely you need to exercise faith in Christ in order to be saved. So um, again, I think that what he's talking about here when he says all creation is not that he's preached to every single person at this point, but that he's preached without distinction to both Jew and Gentile. So as we wrap up this uh, section of Colossians, just a couple verses here, few verses, uh, we want to stop and say again, so what? So we can say that um, the world offers us a lot of things we can hope for. A uh, nicer home, larger bank account, uh, perhaps um, just simply more food on the table, comfort and security physical and financial security. Lots of good things. Those are good things we hope for. But heaven offers us only one hope that really transforms us, and that hope is Jesus Christ. Him supreme. Him exalted. He is the hope that motivates. Look what Paul says in Titus 2. For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, that is the hope that motivates that is the hope that prepares us for the future glory that is going to be ours when Christ appears and gathers us to himself and takes us to heaven. It's going to prepare us for that moment when we're pre presented before the Lord and our works are assessed and we are rewarded according to our works. Our salvation, brothers and sisters, is not in doubt. What is what it what? What Paul is urging here and what the Lord is urging on us is to live today in light of eternity and put to work the gifts that he's given us so that we may approach him at that day of judgment, the day when our works will be assessed, confident and sure of our future reward. So God bless you, brothers and sisters, and I pray that this... Uh, is uh, both um, encouraging you to read the word yourself, that it's uh, edifying you as uh, you're learning more and more about the word and that, it is that you are being educated more and more in God's word. That's the purpose of this Theofaith ministry. Um, and that's the purpose. I take the time to do this and uh, may God bless you and may he prepare you for that day of presentation. God bless you, brothers and sisters.